invite Showbiz Christchurch, Michael Bailey, uh, to come forward and talk about the fantastic Showbiz Christchurch. Thank you very much. Showtime. It's a wonderful discipline for me to have to sit in front of the microphone. I'm used to walking around and waving my hands. Excellent. <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, the invitation and for allowing the time to come and talk to you all. Um, this is, uh, on many levels, just a, an opportunity to say thank you uh, for all of the support that has been given to us over the years and to let you know what the results on that investment are at the moment. Uh, obviously, uh, like the rest of the city, uh, we have had an externally induced hiatus, um, but we are back and roaring now that the Isaac Theatre Royal has reopened. So just uh, over the last three years, um, our shows have encouraged tens of thousands of people to come back into the central city. Uh, we are part of revitalising that central city economy. I know that the hospitality industry uh, is delighted every time we get a show into the theatre because those 20,000 or so patrons who come to the show are very happy to go to the local uh, bars, cafes, staying in hotel. We have a lot of out-of-town guests coming in, so uh, the airport and the uh, taxi companies are getting a nice slice of trade as well. Um, the shows that we staged as I'm sure that you're all aware, we are a, a totally local company, so the performers that you're seeing on stage, backstage and in the orchestra are all Christchurch residents and over the last three years um, we've had over a thousand people participate directly in our shows and that is laying the foundations of a number of things. Uh, for some of those volunteer participants, they're going to go on to careers as performers, as educators, running arts companies or, in many cases, just a lifetime love of theatre, um, which is good for us, good for our city. Uh, we have, from the moment that it's been open, we've been the number one hirer of the Isaac Theatre Royal. In 2016, we were over 50% of their total attendance, and uh, we're well on track for 2018 to be doing the same again. Um, but if you look up on the screen, you'll actually see, I'm just here to say, um, happy birthday to us. <laughs> it's our, uh, our 80th anniversary and uh, we're taking an opportunity to celebrate this with the shows that we're doing this year. We have also uh, just embarked on an oral history. Uh, we are collecting the memories of uh, some of our long-term members. At our launch this year we were delighted to have one of the cast from our first show, 1938, uh, wow. attending our launch this year. We have members from the 40s, the 50s and onwards um, who are still very active participants, participants in our society. Uh, last night was our AGM, obviously our life members all there. Um, that is when you get a significant slice of history. We're aware that our 100th is only 20 years around the corner, so we want to make sure that those memories don't evaporate. Um, so we have commissioned a series of oral histories now so that we can get them all down uh, with the potential of collating a book for the 100th year anniversary. So just to take us back, um, <laughs> this building, the front wall still exists. So the containers on Tuam Street, um, that is the old uh, St James Theatre, which was renamed as the Odeon, um, and that happens to be the first wow. production of Christchurch Operated Incorporated in 1938, so 80 years ago. Wow. Um, massive leap forward, because one of the things I want to uh, highlight to you is, um, yes, we're in a razzmatazz industry, it, it is all jazz, hands and fun, um, but it's actually a massive, serious business um, that on a global scale is one of the giants of the entertainment industry. Um, because people enjoy musical theatre, yeah. um, sometimes they forget to realise uh, just what an incredible enterprise it is. Uh, so this was a turning point for musical theatre right across New Zealand. It was a turning point for showbiz. <coughs> Why? Uh, because New Zealand was the first country in the world that was offered the, the rights as community theatre companies to stage Les Miserables. We all went, yay, and then suddenly went, oh no, <laughs> because none of us could afford to stage it, none of us had the resources to stage it. We were all trading as individual societies in different cities, run by volunteers, volunteer committees, volunteer boards, etc. Um, and somebody came up with the smart idea of saying, hey, why don't we collaborate? Why don't we put all of our resources together and work for the greater good? And uh, with a lot of soul searching and sleepless nights, that's exactly what happened. Um, because these collective societies not only had to uh, relinquish their power and control and agree to let one person design, one person build, and for everyone to be set with the same production that we would each collectively use one after another over a four or five year period, we all also had to put $150,000 into a pot that we may not see a return on for five years' time. So for a community society, that's, that, that's a very big leap of faith. 
I'm delighted to say it was an enormous success. In 1994, Les Miserables staged in Christchurch. It sold out before opening night uh, to 34,000 patrons coming to see the show, um, making it uh, the largest musical that had ever been staged in the city. Um, it is coming later this year, so for anyone who feels that they missed out the first time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, the eyes of the Theatre Royal uh, is a natural home for us. The stage of shows that we produce are on an extremely grand scale. We are very happy to say that we are staging shows, and I choose this word carefully, that are bigger than Broadway. I'm not going to use the other B word, the better. That's up for you guys to say that. Um, but they are bigger than Broadway in the sense that we, uh, we do, as a voluntary society, work with bigger casts, larger lighting rigs, larger orchestras, etc. So you are seeing a fully internationally scaled show that would be bigger than you may have spent thousands of dollars to travel to New York to see. Um, but that requires a very specific sort of theatre, and uh, when the Isaac Theatre Royal was reopened in 2014, uh, we were delighted because we need that massive backstage area with the proscenium arch, fly tower and orchestra pit. So the only venue that we are able to stage the shows that we do um, is the likes of the Isaac Theatre Royal. It is now the finest heritage theatre in Australasia. Phantom of the Opera. This was the first major musical in the Isaac Theatre Royal. Um, so just to give you a sense of scale, um, until two years ago, this was the highest grossing entertainment piece of all time. That's bigger than Rolling Stone's World Tour, bigger than the Titanic movie series, uh, and it has been overtaken recently. Uh, the biggest grossing entertainment on the planet is now Lion King, the musical. So um, musicals are extraordinarily bu extraordinary businesses. Uh, to open a new musical on Broadway, the investment ranges from 15 to $35 million and takes four and a half years of full houses to return the original investment. Uh, oh. Obviously, shows of this nature are never going to come to New Zealand in a fully professional capacity. We simply don't have the population. We don't have the tourism throughput. Large-scale musicals tend to exist in very large international cities that have huge tourism numbers. So our community theatre structure is bringing shows to New Zealand that would never otherwise be staged here on this scale. And uh, we're getting extremely good at it, and the rights holders are now very happy with us because they charge us a high percentage per ticket. Uh, and uh, they are now giving us the rights to some of the latest and greatest shows in the world, which leads me to some of my next slides. Um, so <laughs> last year, hopefully many of you got to come along uh, and see Priscilla. <laughs> and oh, happy yeah. Pride That's Week, great. everybody. Um, this, was, this happened during the Pride Festival uh, last year, um, and we're associated again with the Pride Festival this year. Uh, this show was built in Christchurch. We built a new bus. Um, we are pretty much the primary employer, in fact, no, it's not pretty much. We are the primary employer of Scenic Solution, who are the largest set design firm in New Zealand. We're keeping them gamefully employed at least 10 months of the year with our show builds. Um, so they uh, built the bus and sets at a cost of a quarter of a million dollars for Priscilla. So this show is now available for other societies to hire. It opens in Dunedin in three weeks' time, then it heads off to New Plymouth. If these shows aren't built by Showbiz Christchurch, no other society in New Zealand will get to stage them. It's as simple as that. And all of those builds are happening here in Christchurch. We are driving a, an industry which now sees Christchurch recognised as the centre of excellence. So uh, you can proudly leave the room today and say, our city council is supporting a centre of excellence in musical theatre in New Zealand, because that is the absolute truth. Which brings us to opening night in... 15 days time. Wicked. Mm. Hope to see you there. <laughs> Wicked. Uh, this is the New Zealand Theatre Company premiere. Once again, this is a new build production that we're creating specifically for our season. We have 10 other community theatre companies around New Zealand that have signed higher agreements for this after us. So we staged around the rest of the country. So the good news is year after year after year on our forward calendar, which goes through till 2025 at the moment, uh, we have New Zealand theatre company premieres of some of the biggest shows in the world. That is going to drive business into Christchurch, that is going to bring, bring people to the city to visit. I can tell you, every other theatre company in New Zealand is coming to Christchurch on either the 6th or 7th of April this year, um, because they're all desperate to see this show. Uh, this is the second highest grossing musical of all time on Broadway. It was the fastest musical to reach a billion dollars in ticket sales on Broadway. These are major, major shows. For us to stage a show of this nature as a community company, the budget is still upwards of a million dollars. So these are a very high risk venture and we are delighted that we are able to successfully manage that. 
So in a nutshell, over 80 years, more than 2 million people have come to our shows. It's actually significantly more than 2 million, but I'm being conservative on my estimates there. We think we've nudged past 2.5 million, but it's a hard number to pin down. Uh, we've had over 30,000 volunteers directly participate in our shows who have gone on to lifetime careers. Um, if you go through the court theatre at the moment, uh, a number of the established performers there, like Yvonne Martin, Linda Milligan, um, a number of the court trustees, they all started their life doing what was uh, Christchurch Operatic Society shows, now called Showbiz, um, but we are still doing that. So many of our members leap off our show stage and go to international exposure, international training. We are creating a whole new generation of theatre practitioners. Since the Isaac Theatre Royal opened in 2014, uh, 125,000 people have been to see showbiz shows. We are, by a garden mile, the number one hirer of that venue. We are underpinning the success of the Isaac Theatre Royal as a long-term asset to the city. Uh, in 2016, uh, that year alone, we had uh, about 20 under-18s performing in our show, aged between 16 and 18, so all um, year 12 and 13 students at high school, etc. In that particular year, it was a bit of a bump crop. Six of our performers from that year uh, attained places in some of the top theatre schools in the world. Um, there's one in uh, the London Academy of, Song, uh, of Stage and Dance, uh, one over in Whopper, the best uh, musical theatre school in Australasia, one over in VCA, um, two at Brent Street under full scholarship, and one doing performing arts down in Otago. So they're now all 18 or 19. We think they're going to be some of our future New Zealand stars. And as I've said before, creating a centre of musical theatre excellence. I can, this is a little anecdotal, but I can tell you that we've just had auditions for Les Miserables last weekend, and we had three people who were new to the city, and we said, oh, what brings you to Christchurch? Because they were all here to study various courses. They said, oh, we came here to do shows. They have chosen to relocate to Christchurch because they're so thrilled with the opportunities that are available. Um, to perform. Thank you so much for your time. Um, any questions? No, Michael, I'm sorry, but um, we have to move on with the council Absolutely. agenda. But Thank this you. is a wonderful opportunity for the council to acknowledge the wonderful work of Showbiz Canterbury and to wish you a very happy birthday, which I hadn't mm. realised was the 80th. So thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Really looking forward to Wicked and the other shows on your, um, on your programme. So thank you. <laughs> Right, so now we move on to um, deputations by appointment, and we have five deputations on item nine, local alcohol policy. Um, so I'd like to call Dr Alistair Humphrey, thank you, Canterbury Medical Officer of Health. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and talk to you. I will be brief. Um, I will simply give you a summary of why uh, the District Health Board and, and myself as, as a regulatory officer responsible for licensing feel that the local alcohol policy is an important tool for us to use to curb alcohol harm. Some of you may remember um, the Law Commission report, um, the front page of which, the cover, we were sadly the, the poster town for that report, Curb Alcohol in Our Lives, Curbing, uh, Curbing the Harm, which was a Law Commission report back in 2010. And on the front cover, there was um, the, the picture of uh, the terrace with, with with the problems that arise from acute alcohol intoxication. But from the District Health Board's perspective, it is not just acute harm. Acute harm causes an enormous burden in our, for our general practice, for our after-hours medical centres, for our regular general practices, actually, the day after, um, and for our emergency department. And acute harm leads to some um, it is not just uh, minor injuries. Um, we, we regularly have examples of uh, damage 
to people from alcohol intoxication that costs all of us uh, millions of dollars never mind the tragedy to the people and the families who are dealing with people who often have long-term disability as a consequence of accidents. But the other important part of the, the damage that alcohol does, which was raised in that original Royal Commission report, and we have followed up with our own data, is that there are long-term consequences to increasing consumption of alcohol. Uh, to the tune in this uh, in, 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 in Canterbury District Health Board of close to $100 million a year. That's what we are all paying uh, to deal with the, not just the short term but also the long term consequences. Things like breast cancer for which alcohol is a significant risk factor, stroke, hypertension. So these are all things that our community has to face because of an insidious increase in alcohol consumption. There are not many tools provided to us by the 2012 Act, and not all the recommendations of the Law Commission, and certainly some of the more potent recommendations, were not picked up by the government of the day, uh, in particular those that relate to well, fiscal tools, if you like, taxation and the like, which was disappointing. But make no, no mistake, the tools that we were given do have an effect. Um, and the local alcohol, alcohol policy was one of those. Christchurch, in my view, as in so many things, he says in a slightly one-eyed way, but as in so many things, we were ahead of the game with our local alcohol policy. We had a progressive alcohol policy that was going to uh, um, permit and indeed possibly improve vibrancy in our central city, while at the same time making sure that we didn't suffer the, or we minimized the consequences of harm from alcohol. Uh, it is a policy that deals not just with on-license sales, but very importantly with off-license sales. And the fact that we have had such a strong resistance from organizations that want to sell alcohol, such as the supermarkets, suggests that um, the policy was effective. There are other issues around the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act that I, as medical officer of health, have had to fight with supermarkets in particular in the courts. And I'm happy to say most of the time, not all of the time, most of the time we fight and we win. But make no mistake, they squeal because um, the increase in sales over the last 20 or 30 years, particularly in supermarkets, has been enormous. I will make one comment, because I did for the local alcohol policy last time, about unlicensed sales. Uh, with our tri-agency approach to alcohol over the last 20 or so years, our host responsibility in this city is second to none. Um, our managers of bars are a long way from where they were 20 or 30 years ago. And I have said um, that the safest place to have a drink is in a bar. Mm. Um, it, it, the reason for that is because we have well-trained managers who are well supervised overall by the police um, who will look after you um, when you have a drink. They will give you water or food if you need it and they'll give you a taxi to get home. But that on-license um, environment has to be supervised. We have to be able to monitor it. And it was for that reason that we supported the police in having a relatively well-circumscribed area where we could all enjoy ourselves late into the night. Um, and what we are now seeing with the rejuvenation of Christchurch is the market is bringing people back into the city. So the objections we have had from, from um, those on licenses who have wanted to maintain what I call chasing the drunken dollar at three o'clock in the morning uh, in, in the suburbs of Christchurch, not popular with the residents there and very difficult to manage. Um, th what they are seeing is in fact um, 
people are moving back into the city to a vibrant city centre um, where we can all enjoy ourselves safely. <coughs> so there, those are just a few examples, but there were a huge range of very positive tools in that local alcohol policy that will ensure that we have both a vibrant city but also a safe city in which we can enjoy ourselves. And I would ask the council that they revisit the issue of the local alcohol policy. It is a tool that is valuable um, for, for all of us, um, those of us that want to consume alcohol, those of us that want to sell alcohol, and those of us that are responsible for ensuring that people are safe while they do so. Right. Any questions? Um, questions, yes. So we've got time for questions. Jimmy? One question I want to ask the Dr. Pamphrey. Uh, do you think that the existing provisional local alcohol policy you know, can play this function? Because I remember back to several years ago, you know, police, you and the wider the community individuals, more than 4,000 uh, submissions. In that time, I was very impressed with all those submissions. If a new one and the existing one, what's the difference? Can can you know the achieve the, this this goal? The new one um, is a watered down version of the original one. Um, a local alcohol policy is better than no alcohol policy at all. So, does that answer your question? I I, I think we should have one. I think the rigour that was applied and the mandate, let's not forget the very strong mandate for that initial policy, um, remains, I believe, um, but it was watered down and it was watered down uh, because of, uh, in my view, some very clever legal um, uh, manoeuvring on the part of the, the alcohol industry. David. Um, one of the uh, strong points that you made was the cost to the health industry of <coughs> treating um, alcohol-impaired people. What are the um, um, steps, impediments, or processes that you could go to actually install a charge on those people that have obviously just overstepped the mark and cost the city and the health industry a lot of money. Can, can we, or, or are there impediments that would be in place for the hospital board to actually levy a charge on people who obviously have just made a donkey of themselves and ended up in hospital? Two, two aspects to that. First of all, as a doctor, I treat people uh, we all, all, all health professionals, sign up to some form of Hippocratic Oath. They treat people who have made fools of themselves. They treat people under all circumstances. Um, punishing people financially for the problems they get themselves into is not likely to, to work. Um, but the other point I made, and, and, and it's very important to understand this, a very high proportion of our health costs are for the for the invisible costs that you don't realize. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, take, for example, um, hypertension and stroke. It is well known uh, alcohol has a significant contribution to that. Not all of it, but a significant contribution in terms of risk. Now, when a supermarket sells Sauvignon Blanc for six or seven dollars a mm. bottle, the shopper and I say innocently pushing their trolley down that aisle who happens to see it might think, oh, um, I'll, chuck a, I'll chuck one of those in the trolley, that's not very expensive, maybe a couple. And that insidious increase in alcohol consumption can end up many years later with that shopper suffering from hypertension or a stroke, paralyzed in a wheelchair or with a breast cancer problem that needs expensive treatment. And that's a very insidious issue. We have to deal with it on a population health level. We have to understand that the harm from alcohol is not just intoxication. Mm. 
it's the going home at night and having one glass of wine that's kind of just to relax and is okay and then it becomes two and maybe three and that's driven by low costs and availability mm. and that is one of the things that the local alcohol policy sought to deal with um, the other issue of obviously is that is the difficulty between on and off licenses cheap off license sales mm. are undercutting and damaging our local hospitality economy. Yep. Here, here. We've seen it all over the country, which particularly starkly in Dunedin, where bars have closed because cheap off-license sales have meant they can't run their businesses. A, a classic quote from the manager of the Captain Cook was he, the students turning up to his bar, turned up more intoxicated than when they, live, when they left. He was looking after them, giving them food and water, and then sending them home but not selling anything. So we have to also, if we want a city um, where we can enjoy ourselves in the evening, um, we need to deal with the preloading and sideloading. And that means shortening the time in which off-license sales are made. And um, m remember that most off-license sales are consumed within an hour of purchase. So people who buy cheap alcohol from supermarkets are not putting it in their cellar, they're drinking it. Within, within an hour or two. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got a time restriction on you, but thank you very much for your um, deputation. Thank you. Um, the Canterbury branch of the Hospitality Associ Hospitality New Zealand, Amy McClellan Minty and Peter Morrison. Thank you. Um, this deputation is made on behalf of the Canterbury Branch of Hospitality New Zealand and concerns agenda item 0.9 relating to the decision on whether or not to proceed with the preparation of a fast-track local alcohol policy. HNZ was asked to provide its views on the three options considered on this agenda item and we expressed a firm position that the formulation of a new local alcohol policy should be put on hold until October 2019 for a new council to agree on a process to be completed by August 2022, with the default provisions of the Act remaining in place until then. We do not downplay the serious loss of alcohol-related harm in our communities, and HNZ advocates for workable solutions. In this instance, we are firm in our view that advancing a local health policy is not the uh, uh, solution to achieve this outcome. It is very disappointing for all parties, I am sure, to be back in this position after debating the need for LAP and after almost, almost reaching negotiation last year on the provisional LAP that could have satisfied all the interested parties at no further cost to the ratepayer and involved applicants. Rather precariously, this is not referred to in the staff report. We believe this council and previous councils have been misled by staff who have failed to accurately inform you. This in part led to the High Court proceedings that were brought on the Council in 2017. Back in 2013, the draft LAP received the largest number of submissions on a Council policy, with 76.4 per cent opposing the content, which again has been misreported to you by your staff. If you take anything away from this deputation, then please let it be these following points. One, you were told in 2013 that it was too early to prepare LAP with the city still in recovery mode. That would come at a significant cost and that the process would lead you to fail legally. All these points were correct. You were also told that you cannot use it, LAP as a planning tool to inflict zoning decisions on the central city and the High Court agreed with us. The costs and failure risk to you as a council in making a decision to advance at LAP again is high and there are many in the community who are ready to take you to task at every step of this process. We know that the council has not even bothered to contact the other two applicants who brought about the appeal proceedings. Two, think long and hard about what a LAP achieves and whether there is an issue at a local level that you can realistically address. You'll be shown slides from the police and public health de depicting alcohol-related harm, horrible energies, accompanied by national and international statistics. What you won't be told is that this harm is occurring at the home and in un uncontrolled drinking environments, something an LAP cannot address. 
and not, I'd say, not occurring in Christchurch's highly regulated, monitored and enforced bars. Effective tools to reduce alcohol-related harm need to be implemented at a central government level, addressing matters such as pricing, age and availability, as well as provision of education for the end users of alcohol. The LAP does not uh, actually restrict a person access to alcohol and does not prevent all harm from occurring. It just shovels the pro problem around. While it is admirable to try and fix this issue, the LAP is not the answer. Four, what you are told in your staff report is that the Act has provisions to address bad licences. What you are not told in your staff report is that the Act has provisions to address bad licences, prevent new premises, establish in areas with high densities of existing premises and to avoid the proliferation of off-premises. The district plan places controls on the location of licensed premises from residential areas and imposes noise limits on businesses. You should find it very suspicious that a thorough evaluation of how the Act works in practice and the relationship of the district plan to alcohol work in our community and has not been provided to you. The issue is that this council faces, faces appears to be associated with the proliferation of off licences and not on premises. You have been misinformed that the only way to address this is by an LAP. We know of only four off licence applications since 2015 that have generated interest within the respective communities and each, each have gone through the statutory process under the default provisions of the Act, being mandatory public notification and a hearing and refused or with being withdrawn due to the opposition. This is a robust process and it allows those in the affected community to be involved in decision making, meaning that those not affected do not have to be put through the cost as a ratepayer to deal with via an LAP. Four applications over four years can hardly be seen as an administration burden for the agencies. Significantly you have been informed, mis misinformed on both cost and the time frame to establish an LAP. Your staff predict a cost of 150k, including excluding legal costs for appeals. We estimate the cost to be closer to 1.5 million, including appeals. The high likelihood of appeals means that there is still a risk that you will not end up with an LAP. Peter, can I just interrupt? The, the, the last sentence, I just don't think. I mean, you can refer to council, the impact on councillors, but not the impact on staff, if that's OK. Oh, just, just the very last sentence right. of that para. Thank you. Yeah. I implore, that you, implore you to keep this in mind when spending more ratepayer money on top of the two million already spent, as it will cost you, as councillors, that, who, who you will be held accountable. Yeah. Finally, HNZ and its technical advisors have offered to sit down with council staff to help them address the flaws in the approaches to date. But this has been rejected. We are here before you as the decision makers, the one, uh, as you the decision makers, the ones we voted for, dealing with a report that only gives you half of the picture and could well be the foundation of further legal proceedings. We are more than willing to work with the council and agencies to reduce alcohol related issues in our communities, but stand firm that LAP is not the way to do this and that the decision needs to be made to park this process until for the, for the next council to uh, properly re-evaluate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do, do, are you. do you want to speak as well? Or? No. No, that's good. Um, so we'll open it up for questions. Um, I'll just pick up one thing. Um, you know, you did identify the, the position that the public health uh, would adopt, but in fact what we heard from the public health was that the safest place to drink was um, on licensed premises and that the real cause of a lot of the harm that we see is the very cheap alcohol that's sold through off licences um, which leads to pre-loading and um, I hadn't heard side loading before but that's obviously um, when you go to a bar and then zip out for, for a, a cheap drink that's been bought from an off licence and then zip back to the bar. So that must be hugely challenging for the industry. We agree with that as well. Um, what Dr Humphrey didn't tell you is that actually alcohol consumption in New Zealand is falling. He says it's increasing. It is falling. We've always said that um, the pricing in supermarkets especially has been a big problem. Yeah. Um, um, and we, as an on-premise 
we have off-premise uh, licensees. We've got off-premise licensees that want a, um, a bylaw put in that there's no more off-licenses in Christchurch. But it's it's a matter of getting that done. Yeah, OK. Uh, Dion and then Phil. So you're not saying that hospitality in New Zealand are against an LAP at some stage? We've never been against an LAP. What we're asking for is... It's t well, what we've always said at this current point of time, it's premature. We still have another 16 on-licence premises going to open down the terrace. So we don't really know what we're dealing with. So, yeah, we've never said we don't want one. We're just saying we would prefer to wait until we know what sort of demographic and environment we're dealing with. Yeah. The, sol yeah. the solution we had, which we, I'm very disappointed couldn't have been addressed, um, before this all went off, is that we had solutions and, and to, to an LAP, and that was uh, to grandfather, or was, as the mayor told me, it's really grandparent, the ad, and <laughs> handful of existing premises outside the central city that have um, two or three AM licences, and to enable Victoria Street for three AM trading for the entire length of the LAP period. So we, we, it was quite easy, we could have fixed this. Can I, sorry, I just wanted to say before we run out of time, Chasing the drunken dollar at 3 a.m. We don't. We've got two premises in all of Christchurch that trade past 3 a.m. Um, so, and we're also not saying that those that have an 11 p.m. in the residential areas currently should be extended to three, because no. that's that doesn't make sense to have a premise trading till one or two in the morning when they've got residents right next door. Yeah, tra chasing the drunken dollar at 3 a.m. Two bars. Trade past three in Christchurch. Yeah. Phil? Can I just ask you in our report? Five um, seconds. The understanding, the understanding is that your view is that li um, license, the license appeals process is that that's sufficient to actually for community groups to be able to um, make their case as part of the applications. But can I just ask you? What, what, how, how do you believe that small community groups and ordinary people can actually have all the information in quite a, in, and address quite a complex process to achieve what you're saying they can? Because the licensing inspectors guide them on how to place an objection to an off-premise application. My real they question, get guidance from the my real question is why should community why groups have to go to all that trouble with very few resources when clearly Hospitality New Zealand have got large resources? Okay, so then if that's if that's your position on it, then why are you prepared to capture the on-licence market mm. to take care of an off-premise issue? Problem. How is that possibly fair to a, as Dr Humphreys refers to, it is the safest place to be drinking as an on-licence premise. So why are you trying to capture the on-licence market when you've got a serious issue with the off-premise? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look, thank you for your time. That's um, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could we invite the New Zealand Police Inspector Richard Bruce, Area Prevention Manager, Christchurch Metro. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I'm the Area Prevention Manager for Christchurch Metro, which means that I cover the alcohol harm area for the city. Um, but also today I'm representing Superintendent Lane Todd as the Acting Area Commander um, in his role for the city as well. So thank you for the chance to speak on the local alcohol policy. Um, we also um, believe that it's an important tool to address alcohol calm, so we support that view. Um, our preference um, from the police is that alcohol policy be enforced at the earliest opportunity, um, and therefore we support the recommendation in the paper to prepare a draft policy as soon as possible. Uh, Christchurch has still experienced alcohol-related harm, and a local alcohol policy will help address that harm. Um, the section in the paper on page 57 um, is still the police's view, particularly around that any delay to a local alcohol policy will result in additional unnecessary victimisation due to alcohol-related offending and harm. So in summary, this is a, um, a brief presentation from us at a high level to say that we support the recommendation in the paper um, and that our preference is for an alcohol policy to be enforced at the earliest opportunity, please. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Tim, did you have a question? Uh, it was really one for the hospitality guys, but the same for you. If we started the process of the LAP, which is the important thing, or I feel it is, um, 
If it were to exclude the central city, so we concentrate on communities first as we work through the process of the lap, because that is quite clear in it, that we, we have to have a clear process, would you be in support of that? Because the last lap that we had did seem to come unstuck, and if you look throughout New Zealand, laps have failed. So if we concentrate on our communities first, which is the off-licence, and then as we work through that process with all the partners, which would be the uh, Hospitality New Zealand yourselves, or the District Health and interested parties, and go from there. So we concentrate on the communities first and the off-licences, and then work our way and as we go through with that further sure. information. Um, I know I'd, our preference would be to start with the whole city and do the city centre as well. Okay. I think with the bars that are there and the bars that are coming, um, and, the, and the problems that we used to have when it was destroyed um, many years ago, um, in that area, I think that the preference for the police would be that we actually deal with it as one city and deal with the sub suburbs and the issues that are there around hours and locations, etc. But also deal with them in the city as well. Um, Glenn, then Yanni, Sarah. Thank you. Could you give us a, a quick sum of uh, the outstanding or the uh, issues that stand out, rather, um, that you see in your staff? Um, in the central city and also in the suburbs from the harm of uh, you know, harm caused by alcohol? Sure. Well, I think I suppose at a, at a high level we see a lot of jobs that are related to alcohol um, being involved and that causes um, work for our staff and causes harm for the community um, around violence, etc., um, domestic violence. Um, so we see that um, any steps that help reduce alcohol harm for the community has got to be a positive move for the police. And that is a, a tool, the LAP um, is a tool that helps address alcohol harm, so we would support that. Could I sort of just follow up? Um, are you able to delineate, you know, the, the major, you know, any major differences though between the, the on licence issues that you see and then the issues that you see in uh, suburbia? Um, only, only to the point that uh, obviously preloading from off licences is a, is a buying alcohol and drinking somewhere else is an issue um, for us, and we know that's always been an issue. Um, and then uh, with the bars, we have an opportunity to control them, I suppose, because there's regulations with them, um, and it's not in a public place, so we can actually get in there and, and do, our, do our work there. So I can't delineate to the point that you're saying, but I can say that there's both things require attention from us. Um, Yanni, then Sarah. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for the, the deputation. Oh. I was just looking, uh, I was just wondering really what the New Zealand police are doing uh, at a national level. If you've, uh, you know, like for a council, for example, we've got mayors that will be talking about the various um, issues associated with the, the lapse through the courts and through implementation, what's worked, what hasn't. Are, are you doing anything nationally looking at the effectiveness? Because um, I guess I was just interested in what's happened in Dunedin where, you know, the, the quote in the media was, police's failure to present evidence for one of the reasons that the court ruled a certain way and we're hearing both sides of the argument today from people that you know think we need one think you know we should defer it we yeah is there anything that you guys are looking at nationally as a New Zealand police in terms of how these LAP processes can be better, get better outcomes for everyone concerned sure I, I haven't got a national view for you but I've come here with a view for Christchurch Metro um, is that we our view is that we support it being proceeded with um, and I think the process that go through will, will take care of some of the issues that you're raising as we go through we'll, there'll be the chance to address those matters and then speak to them and provide our views on them um, in a constructive way. I was just interested if we keep ending up in court sure. and having you know successful appeals it doesn't give much certainty and it can take a lot longer. I, th I think Yanni's referring to the Alcohol um, Regulatory Licensing Authority which recently, you know, threw out the Dunedin uh, lap, which focused specifically on off licences, um, and uh, they were up against the supermarket giants um, in terms of the response. Yeah, I mean, I'm just concerned that there's a community expectation that a lap can deal with some of these issues. When it when it goes through the process, what we're seeing around New Zealand is is it's it's actually not, and it's been chucked out on appeal in many cases. So. I was just interested in the police were looking at any sort of collective response to that. Um, well, I haven't got the answer for that off the off hand, but I, I can find that if you need it to be. Yeah, well, the, the, um, I'll just quote from the 
from the Mayor of Dunedin, the irony is local alcohol policy is ultimately being decided on in Wellington, and that's a contradiction to what it's there for. So, um, and it's, it's certainly my intention to have a conversation with, with the Mayor of Dunedin about um, the circumstances they found themselves in. Um, Sarah and then David. Uh, David? Um, you mentioned that um, the police have the ability to uh, enter a bar and regulate things there. What's your response to an, a, um, a process of reinstating um, being drunk in a public place and enforcing some of that? Uh, we seem to have a problem with, with preloaders and we're acknowledging that the bars aren't the problem it's the idiots that drink once they within an hour of buying the stuff at uh, at a cheap off license, and then come to town tanked up. So we've removed removed that statute for being, you, you know, taking a, arresting someone for being drunk in a public place. If that was brought back, what's your impression on the effect that may have in curbing some of our problems in the city? Um, thanks for the question. I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to go down there, um, down because that's not an issue for the police. The, the laws are set by others, and we enforce what we have before us. Um, what I can say, though, is um, steps that you have taken already around um, alcohol ban areas is a positive move yeah. for us. Um, you know, that's a great preventative tool, as I'm sure that you you know already, um, where that gives us a chance for people drinking in a public place. For us, instead of waiting for other offending to occur, like assaults, robberies, um, further disorder. We then have a preventative tool that we can actually act quite positively with um, in a very various ways to actually stop people getting um, drunk and causing harm in a public place. So that's a, that's a tool that we support. Um, that's a different issue than this. Yeah. Um, but they are the sorts of things that we would. And then on top of that, rather than um, go down a, a discussion around a whole different legislative option, um, we have options already <coughs> within the Crimes Act, Summary Offences Act, etc., to deal with, say, disorder in a public place. Yeah. So, so once it tips over the line, so I think that um, you know that there's a, a harking back to the to the olden days where the, you know sort of the law provided that the that it was an offence to be drunk, but there is still an offence if you do something that's offensive or disorderly, um, the police can act. So you don't need a um, a, a crime that's of drunkenness because if you do have one then you have to arrest them, you have to process them, you'd have to put them in a police cell and if they were under um, 17 you'd have to um, deal with under the legislation that deals with children and young persons. So um, I went out on a night visit with the police and I suspect that, you know, with um, and I, I think it would be worthwhile for councillors to do that to go out, I mean this mine was a quite a, a long time ago, but I watched the police diffuse circumstances, situations, just by the um, taking a, a, a measured approach. The alcohol ban certainly assisted in the CBD in terms of taking open bottles and just pouring them down the drain. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, it, it was a good way, but the 15 year old who was completely um, well, almost comatose on the side um, of the road. The fact that they were put in a taxi, that the parents were prepared to pay for the taxi at the other end, there'd been contact made, that to me is the way you solve that situation, not arresting somebody and processing them. So I think that's reasonable. Anne? Um, just um, going back to, to the home, actually, and domestic violence, are you able to give us any um, statistics in terms of how much um, the domestic violence incidents you attend are actually fuelled by alcohol abuse? No, I haven't. I haven't gone. Yeah. Uh, we thought our view was to come here with a high level view about the local right. alcohol policy, okay. yeah. and we would save that type of data question. for further discussions. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. That, yeah. that. I mean, I really recommend that councillors yeah. read the Royal Commission yes. report because yeah. you will understand that there are a variety of tools that are required. It's not, not just the. Richard? Local alcohol plan. Look, thank you very much for your time um, this morning. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Could I invite Wayne Hawker to come forward, please?
Good morning, my name's Wayne Hawker, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to address you as a council who will be discussing and hopefully making an affirmative decision in regards to the Regulatory Performance Committee's recommendation to develop a new local alcohol policy for the city. As a community member who has just spent nearly 18 hours over just two days this week involved in a district licence hearing, on an application for yet another liquor store in the community of Phillipstown, I felt compelled to be here today to address you as our representatives. From a community's viewpoint, a local alcohol policy is not only extremely important as another tool that would be available to support communities in their challenges of opposing the proliferation of off-licence operators just turning up especially in low socio-economic suburbs, I feel it is essential. Whereas communities should not have to go to the lengths we have had to go to with regards to this application. It has been challenging, tiring, and for many, simply too much, knowing that it really was a David versus Goliath situation, given the applicant's availability to funding and resources, whereas a community could only imagine and wish for. So we look to our elected representatives and say, please help us as we continue to struggle under the weight of the number of liquor outlets just popping up and thinking, oh no, not again. We need your help and support, and a local alcohol policy is a step in the right direction. Like all community objections against such applications, and which, like ours, was in regards to location of a site in very close proximity to other liquor outlets selling predominantly the same products, but in this case, the argument being, oh, we're selling a higher premium product directed at communities living 10 kilometres away. So we looked at the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act 2012 and made particular reference to the object within Section 105, and that being the minimisation of harm, and that really is a key factor in why our local alcohol policy needs to be implemented. As a council, you will be aware of the decisions you have made around cycleways in and around Christchurch and the reasons behind spending millions of dollars to de develop them, albeit against the opinions of many in the communities. My understanding is the need to better protect cyclists as a safety measure, which then says you have identified there is an element of risk of harm if nothing is done given the increase in use of cycles to travel around the city. In the situation of proliferation of off-licensed liquor store, that element of risk of harm caused by alcohol is more than a risk. It is a fact, and it is happening in and around communities all over New Zealand on a daily basis. Physical harm, abuse of harm, mental health harm, financial harm, the list goes on, and yes, it is real, and even as we speak, it is happening somewhere in society. So before anybody argue against the cost of putting together a new alcohol policy, which we all know is more likely going to be opposed by the hospitality industry again, just think about the cost of harm caused by alcohol. Some councillors seem to be balking at the reintroduction of a local alcohol policy because of the more than $1 million for the previous policy, which was withdrawn following a lengthy battle with the hospitality objections, yet they're happy to include to spend $206 million on the 13 proposed cycleways under the long-term plan. Where are our priorities? Alcohol harm is predominant, more predominant in the way it affects society, more so than the level of harm caused to cyclists. In a report released by the Alcohol Watch Group in regards to cost of harm caused by alcohol on New Zealand as a society in 2016, you may be staggered to know that figure was $5 billion in regards to costs on individuals through insurance, medical bills, loss of employment, etc. Then when you factor in the cost on the government as well through costs related to the health sector, road accidents, police, justice system, welfare system, it may seem somewhat scary that we as a society do not appear to have as much concern given the way alcohol is freely consumed, yet the contribution to the government bank accounts was only $960 million through the excise tax on the sale of alcohol. 
Alcohol is something in society that is, has far-reaching actions involved with harm, more so than any product or activity that we care to mention. So this local alcohol policy is not just something that you should sit around and discuss, should we or shouldn't we? Can we afford it? The question is, can you afford not to do it? Given the amount of harm associated with alcohol, as I have pointed out, and please give a special thought to the thousands of victims of alcohol harm. Try and understand what is life like for them. But for me, I do not have to try and understand what life is like when harmed by alcohol, as I have lived through it. And to this day, I still live with both the physical and mental scars inflicted on me by alcohol. And it was also important to note that at the hearing I attended, the applicants made mention of the fact there was no local alcohol policy, which I believe they were saying, as none existed, there is no real barrier for our application other than the community putting in objections, which by all account had to be pretty damning evidence for the district licensing committee to have to consider before making their decisions. Reality is, at the present time in regards to off-licensed liquor stores and with what is in place, everything is currently weighted in their favour, of, in the favour of the liquor industry. It is time to address that imbalance and give us the communities that are left due to best represent us the chance to even up the playing field. And while it will not completely fix the problem, it is definitely a step in the right direction for us as communities. I will also note that when I questioned the applicant in regards to local alcohol policy, he agreed it was a great idea. And yes, he would support it. So is it, so it is getting, getting other sectors of the hospitality to buy into it as well. We elected you to represent us and run the city in the best way to meet our needs. We did not elect the hospitality sector, who seem to have a belief they have more rights than we do. Reality time, they do not. After all, their bottom line is how much they can fill their bank accounts and at what cost to them. They do not really see the true cost that alcohol imposes on society. Please don't just discuss this. Stand up, make a stand, say yes, we have listened to communities, yes, we will do what is right for these communities. They have asked for help and they deserve our help. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Wayne, can I just ask a question? Yep. Um, what specific provision in a local alcohol plan would um, provide you with what you're asking for? Well, I think it's, um, to some extent, the locality of the number of off-licences in any one, you know, residential area. Right. Because, you know, the, the, the one that we're dealing with at the moment is wanting to locate within 50 metres of one that's already existing. Right. So, you know, that's, that's probably the, the, the key thing. But also the hours that they can operate as well. Right. So, so hours of operation and proximity, proximity to other... Proximity, so not could, just to each other, actually, but also local schools and that, because yeah, no, they want to operate as a high school, you we, know. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. But what your real concern is, is that it's the agglomeration of a number of outlets that are available in a local community. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Tim. Um, <clears throat> is a lay person and a member of a community and part of the community saying, wanting to say no or having a say in, in the, the number and where it is, et cetera, in the application. How do you feel the, the hearing process was for your community? Like I say, for our community, I found it very challenging. I was pleased, we were, you know, we were guided by the chair of the licensing committee and you know some of the things we were you know struggling to understand when it turns you know we were trying to put, no you can't talk you can't bring that in because that's new evidence you know and we think well what the hell you know and yet at this stage the applicant has now been given time to go away and prepare new evidence that they didn't have available at the time and i'm thinking well where's the level playing field here you know the, it, it is providing challenges and from this i hope to be working with other communities and, and with the district licensing committee and the alcohol team here at the council to maybe draw up a booklet that will provide support and 
you know, opportunities for the communities to read and understand how they can best prepare themselves when they face challenges like this. Would it help? I mean, it just seems to, to get advice and to sit down with someone with regards to the process. Did you have that? Because we heard before that, you know, our licensing staff give um, advice, but you're saying that in this particular process, it was it, you felt that it wasn't a level playing field because perhaps you didn't understand. We did. We did. You know where the challenges lie yes, to yes. some extent is around timing of when you can. You know. When Look, sorry, 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 sorry. Going. I didn't realise that this is a hearing that's still current, and I think. Oh. I actually think that we shouldn't be discussing it. So, um, look, but but you've made a very powerful point, Wayne. So thank you very much uh, for your submission. Much appreciated. Um, and could I now invite Marty Fuller, um, owner of Trevino's, the Crate Irish Bar and City Park Motel. I've been in the hotel industry for over 40 years, 38 of those in Christchurch, as the Mayor can attest to in her previous life in uh, this industry. I've been on the local hospitality New Zealand executive for over 30 years, was president for 13 years and on the national board for 20 years. I'm a local and national life member of Hospitality New Zealand. I've been on the local Hospitality New Zealand branch subcommittee, overseeing the LAP since its inception. I made submissions on behalf of both of my businesses in 2013 and spoke to both submissions as well as representing the Rickerton Addington Licensees Collective. While my focus is on suburban bars, for the record, I completely oppose the introduction of any LAP and endorse Hospitality New Zealand's preferred position of reverting to the national default house, especially while Christchurch is still going through significant growth stages and demographic changes. It is completely illogical to spend 30 to 40 billion dollars building a new international city in the hope of attracting commerce, conferences, tourists, events and students, only for them to be met by draconian liquor laws. Let's deal with any issues based on facts, not emotion or feel good. In terms of suburban bars, I again completely oppose the introduction of an LAP, especially one that contained a provision of having to shut at 1am as the last one did. And here's why. The term suburban bars was used very sweepingly or generically throughout the last LAP process. But the reality is that there are many different types of suburban licensed premises and that in itself should preclude any type of overriding blanket regime. For example, a large proportion of suburban licensed premises like Trevino's adjoin residential homes and are accordingly in living zones. In order for any of these premises to trade beyond 11pm, they must go through an exhaustive and costly resource consent process and then only get 1am as a maximum closing time with onerous noise management conditions. I know this because I've done it at Trevino's. I've been through it. My point here is that where a licensed premise adjoins residential homes in the suburbs, there are already significant tools available to the authorities to ensure that those neighbours are not adversely affected. The Crack Irish Bar, on the other hand, like the remainder of suburban licensed premises, is situated in a shopping complex and accordingly zoned Business One. It has held a 3am licence since its opening some 20 years ago. While it did have to go through a resource consent initially to trade to 3am, as there are residential houses a short distance from the rear of the premises, there have been no issues with neighbours and the bar's licence has just been renewed for a further three years to 3am with no objection from any of the authorities or the community. In other words, there is no evidence of alcohol-related harm emanating from these premises or any other, for that matter. These suburban licensed premises sit in commercial precincts. These precincts must be built on mixed-use activity. Later night trading is an integral component of a mixed-use environment. All licensed premises, unlike private homes, must, by law, operate in a responsible and caring way. 
We employ security personnel, provide free water and complimentary food at times, organise transport options and generally run a good ship providing an essential local community facility. Why should we be punished in any way for that when there is no evidence of alcohol-related harm? Furthermore, any reduction in hours would have a significant fiscal, economic and social impact on these businesses, something you should take into consideration and would probably spell the death knell for some when there is no evidence that it would lead to a decrease in alcohol-related harm. This would be viewed as unreasonable by ALA in any court hearing, and this is where the introduction of any LAP is fundamentally flawed, because it is based on a premise that if you shut down licensed premises, the potential patrons of those premises will simply go home and watch reruns of Coro Street, and that will lead to a reduction in alcohol-related harm or crime. There is simply no evidence to support that. And that will be viewed as unreasonable by Allah, as it was in the Auckland decision. To the contrary, you will simply be throwing people out of responsible controlled licence premises into uncontrolled environments where any trouble is most likely to occur. When was the last time you saw a media headline involving an alcohol-related incident occurring in or on a licence premises as opposed to one like this? And I'm sorry, but at the back of your... Um, a presentation, but you will get it. I enclose two media headlines. Bottles hurled as police shut parties. Police take an hour to control bottle hurling student party. And that is two I play. There are many, many more. But again, I pose the question to you. When was the last time you saw a headline that involved trouble of that nature from a licensed premise? There aren't any. We all share concerns around any incidents of alcohol-related harm but an LAP is not going to remedy that. I believe most of your concerns revolve around the off-premise market and subsequent activities like pre-loading and side-loading. But there are already ample tools available to the authorities under the Act to control or limit this. What an LAP would or could do is inadvertently capture or impact on licensed premises who are doing an excellent job under not always easy circumstances to provide an essential service to Christchurch in aid of its recovery. This is not fair or reasonable. In 2013, in my submission at that time, I said, and I quote, fundamentally, I believe it is at best premature and in fact plain wrong that Christchurch is even preparing an LAP at this stage. The Council cannot possibly hope to put something in place now that will accurately represent the demographics of this city over the next five years a consideration that is encased as a requirement in the Act. This in itself is a strong reason for not developing an LAP at all, which is the Council's right, and simply allow the default hours under the Act to apply, as is the case now. These are still, these are still a reduction in what we previously had." Unquote. You were warned then, not just by me, about the folly of such a move, and nearly $2 million later, you are warned again. Let me conclude with a number of questions for you. Are you aware of how many licensed premises there actually are outside the CBD that currently have a 2am or 3am licence? Are you aware of how many of these actually use it on a regular basis, albeit that they view it as an important asset to their business to be used as and when they need it? Before you embark on a potentially very expensive gamble with ratepayers' money, have you actually seen what tangible evidence the DHB, the police or any other community group has got that can directly attribute any alcohol-related harm in the community to licensed premises? Are you fully aware of the contents of the Auckland ALA decision and the evidence or lack of it that they based their decision on? Why is it do you think that a number of comparable large cities or competing Tourist hubs like Auckland, Rotorua, Wellington, Nelson and Queenstown are simply relying on the National Default House. And finally, are you convinced that the introduction of an LAP and any subsequent reduction in hours of trading of licensed premises will result in a reduction in alcohol-related harm? If you can't answer any of these questions with conviction, then please do not embark on this hazardous, let alone expensive, 
heavy-handed piece of bureaucracy that could impact detrimentally on our industry's experience and committed professionals who are providing safe, enjoyable and indeed necessary entertainment venues. Why should they be punished for doing a good job when any adverse effects of alcohol consumption are not of their doing? Personally, I believe councils have been thrown a hospital pass from central government with these LAPs. They had every opportunity to include meaningful clauses in the Act, such as minimum pricing, restrictions on price advertising, introducing an actual drinking age, not the age of purchase as we have now, and making it an offence to be drunk in a public place. They put them in the too hard basket and turned it over to councils. Restricting on-premise sales will achieve nothing. Ignore it like the government did. Vote on fact, not feel good, and leave well enough alone. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. We've got 35 seconds <coughs> remaining. Glenn. <laughs> Thank you. Simple question, Marty. Yeah. When will the city be rebuilt? <laughs> I'd suggest that there's about 15 people here in a better position to answer that than me. <laughs> um, however, as Peter alluded to, right now you've got another 16 to 17 licensed premises opening on the terrace. Foolishly, in my opinion, that will be ongoing. For some reason, people seem to think opening a bar is pleasant, joyful, and uh, an instant and guaranteed money winner. Let me tell you, and I'd like to show Mr Hawker my current bank account, because I can assure you it's not. Um, when those places open, they will have an impact somewhere else. There's no more people in Christchurch with any more money. So the hundreds, possibly thousands of people that attend those bars are going to come from somewhere else. They're going to come out of other licensed premises. There is a hope, perhaps, that it might entice people out onto licensed premises who current, currently don't go out. That would be great. But overridingly, they will come from an existing licensed premise. Those premises will be impacted on and probably shut. There have been three licensed premises, to the best of my knowledge, at least, that have closed their doors in the last two weeks, three weeks, in this city. There will be more, I can guarantee you. So that is an evolving demographic. And, 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 and I'm sure I don't have to tell you about what happened after the earthquakes. Everybody moved to the suburbs because the city was shut down. And for a couple of years or so, we had a real battle. It wasn't easy. We were probably ill-equipped to deal with it. We did our best. We got through. And since then, there has been a gradual drift, drift back to the city. My turnover at the crack, for example, is one third of what it was in those first couple of years after the earthquakes. So that is an, an evolution that's going to keep going. And that is a changing demographic of the city. And as I said to you, it is a component uh, a, 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 in the terms of reference of the Act that you must consider the changing demographics of a city. And I don't believe you can do that because I believe the city is going to keep changing, and you people probably know that better than me. Thank you very much, Marty. That's um, um, all extremely helpful, and thank you very much. Thank you. So if I could just um, refer councillors to um, item 9.